everybody and welcome to another gripping instalment of the ASC's online series. These sessions are free to all so please do share the knowledge and if you want to know what's coming up in the series and more about what we do you can visit our website, follow us on social and join our mailing list. That's uh, probably your best bet. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Jarlith Quinn of Smart Vision Europe. Jarlith is a predictive analytics expert, author of the Insider's Guide to Predictive Analytics and his talk on the topic of statistics versus machine learning sparked so much conversation at the ASC conference that we've asked him back for an encore. First though, a huge thank you to the ASC sponsors. It's precisely because of the ongoing generosity of these wonderful companies that the ASC can continue to create a unique blend of knowledge share and events specifically tailored to our sector. Please visit the website for more information on these companies. We really appreciate their support. Okay, over to you, Jarlith. Thank you very much, Matt. Hello, everybody. My name's Jarlith Quinn, and I'm a consultant working for Smart Vision Europe. Uh, two years ago, I had the pleasure of making a presentation to the ASC on the topic of machine learning versus statistics. And today, I'm reprising an updated version of that presentation. I'm going to talk about the fact that machine learning is still a very hot topic in the news and, and across many different industry sectors, if not more so now than when, when I first gave uh, the, the talk on this subject. And I want to take some time to explore the historical context behind the rise of machine learning and contrast that with the evolution of statistics as a discipline and show how they differ from one another, not just in terms of their philosophy, but in terms of what an analyst actually sees when they're working with these different approaches, these different techniques. And I'm then going to finish up explaining why machine learning matters and why statistics still matters before speculating on what the future holds for these, these approaches. Now, it doesn't take a lot of time to create a slide like this. When you Google machine learning, you will be deluged of articles and papers that have been written very recently about the latest developments in the newest applications. Now, I should make the point that, that machine learning has become pretty much synonymous with AI and the term algorithms even in the popular press. And I'm sure that many of you appreciate that technically these aren't the same things, but I'd rather avoid a pedantic discussion about their real differences. Suffice to say that in this context, when the media talk about these types of approaches, what they're really talking about are advanced forms of algorithmic driven decision making that are usually underpinned in some fashion by machine learning techniques. But it's not just a hot button topic for discussion. You know, it's something that organizations are prepared to pay for and currently they still can't seem to get enough people to fulfill the demand. It's a little wonder that statisticians ask you know, where is statistics in all this and one thing's evident if we look at the current job market for positions explicitly associated with machine learning and compare that those to jobs that explicitly mention statistics you know it's certainly not where the money is so it makes sense for us to ask, well, how did we get to this position where machine learning is so valued and, and, and the discipline of statistics is, is very much the Cinderella approach? And to understand that what really differentiates machine learning from, a, say, classical statistical approaches that many of us have been taught or suffered through, we need to understand the historical context. And when we start to look at that, one of the things that's, that's notable is that something as fundamental as the concept of probability, as, as we would understand it today, appears surprisingly late in the history of mathematics. It doesn't really turn up until the 17th century. Even Bayesian statistics, which are very much in vogue or very much fashionable amongst statisticians today, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, of whom they're named after, of course, was, was actually born in 1701. And it's only relatively recently that, that his ideas have found such a large, loyal, and growing audience. Most of the statistical concepts that, that we've been taught at school or at university were formulated in the first half of the 20th century. And in fact, if there was a rule book of introductory stats, it was written by a surprisingly small group of men who were more or less contemporaries of each other. Francis Galton, Carl Pearson, Ronald Fisher, Carl Pearson's son, Egon Pearson, along with his colleague, Jersey Neyman are probably more than anyone else responsible for torching the generations of students enrolled in introduction to stats modules that came after them. 
and they didn't even get along with each other. You know, it's 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 a little known fact that much of the stats that we've been taught are kind of smorgasbord, a, a compromise of ideas that don't always gel that well together. And it's one of the reasons why people find stats hard. But the point here is that all of these techniques, these tools that these people invented, predate modern computing. They were invented before computers. In fact, statistics is a discipline the way one way to think of it is is as a zoo of probability distributions which are pre-calculated and ready to be applied to a host of different applications and problems so if you want to estimate for example the likelihood of multiple insurance claims on the same policy you know there's a distribution for that and if you wanted to estimate the lifetime of a machine part before it fails turns out there's a distribution for that the fact that these things can be estimated in advance means that a statistician can arrive at a problem like a doctor with a bag full of medicines in the knowledge that they can be used to treat the majority or quite a wide range of different problems. Now, if you compare and contrast that to the history of machine learning, it closely follows that of modern computing power. It's it's entirely dependent upon computers. So from the very early forms of neural networks to decision trees right up to what are called convolutional networks that are used to, for example, automatically identify car number plates, and which in turn are the foundation of deep learning algorithms that detect skin cancers today with greater accuracy than most physicians. You know, these are computer-driven algorithms and and, uh, uh, computer-driven approaches. It's very much a computer science discipline. You can also see how, how the terms associated with them, I mean, Machine learning wasn't necessarily a big hot term uh, back in the day. You can actually see how terms fall out of favor. So data mining here fell out of favor uh, and has been replaced or subsumed by terms like machine learning and data science. And there are certain reasons, of course, why machine learning, for example, as a term might capture the popular imagination. You know, for a start, it sounds cool. It sounds impressive. It sounds ominous it's the sort of thing which is which is going to make your article a little bit more interesting i don't think arnold schwarzenegger would have had the same impact if he'd been talking about logistic regression although statistics is you know not grabbing the attention that it used to and it may not be exactly trending in the popular press it's still extremely relevant you can see that since simply doing a a Google, a Google Trend search of statistics as a discipline within the concept of jobs in education, for example. It's still very, very important and relevant to millions of people across the globe. It's only relatively recently that machine learning as a field of study, or data science as it's often referred to, has, has risen up to, to challenge it. The two traditions, however, have evolved sufficiently independently of one another so much so that they even have a different glossary of terms that refer to the same thing. So if you want to be conversant in statistics and machine learning, you've got to know that the way in which a machine learning engineer might refer to a variable is not necessarily the way in which a statistician might refer to a variable. And that really, again, rams home the point that that these are different cultures. To add to the confusion, when the media talk about machine learning, they might just as likely be referring to techniques like statistics that predate uh, modern day computing. In fact, the term machine learning used to refer to a particular and distinct class of techniques like neural networks or support vector machines. In reality, analysts are just as likely to employ statistical techniques like logistic regression or rule induction techniques similar to decision trees. So what does an analyst actually see when they're using these various approaches? Well, this is what the results of a statistical technique like logistic regression uh, look like to a user. What what you're seeing is a table that's comprised of a series of coefficients that relate to the contribution that particular fields make to a predictive model. Statistics students are taught to pour over these outputs, checking test results and loading values and fit statistics. Some of these statistical approaches, approaches actually create reams of output like this In fact, statisticians often complain that certain statistical packages don't create enough output like this. They would like to see a certain test or model coefficient included in the results that the package doesn't offer. Hence the popularity of open source statistical platforms like R that contain thousands of packages 
that generate very specific results. Now, if you compare and contrast that with a decision tree algorithm, which represent the model uh, really as a series of hierarchical rules, we can see it's just much more visual in nature. It's trying to do the same things, trying to predict an, output, uh, an outcome, an output, a dependent variable. But it looks very different. It's a very different approach. And in fact, if you take that further and look at a true machine learning algorithm, like a neural network uh, algorithm, uh, the output here provide little more detail than the graph that represents the structure of the model. There's no, there's no coefficients, there's no test to pour over. These models are often referred to as black box approaches because we can't always see exactly what they're doing. And as such, they tend to be assessed primarily on the basis of their accuracy. But the gulf between the two cultures can be illustrated here. Classical statistics has traditionally been like archaeology, where the model is painstakingly uncovered. Whereas machine learning was always regarded as a bit more of a smash and grab raid, a wee bit more Indiana Jones, where the model is discovered, exploited, before being abandoned in favour of something more exciting. The hostility that the statistical community exhibited to the advent of machine learning is particularly notable and is rather neatly encapsulated in this quote from a paper in 1994 when Warren Sorrell proclaimed, the marketing hype claims that neural networks can be used with no experience and automatically learn whatever is required. This, of course, is nonsense. It's not sure, I'm not entirely sure what marketing hype he's, he's referring to here, but he goes on to say, it is therefore unlikely that applied statistics will be reduced to an automatic process or expert system in the foreseeable future. It is even more unlikely that artificial neural networks will ever supersede statistical methodology. Now, the fact that he's making such a bold statement about something that is in essence predictive is as ironic as he was ultimately wrong. In 1997, the formidable Jerome Friedman added, had we incorporated computing methodology from its inception as a fundamental statistical tool, as opposed to simply using it as a convenient way to apply our existing tools, many of the other data related fields would not have needed to exist. They would have been part of our field. And in 2001, his former collaborator and colleague, Leo Bryman added, the statistical community has been committed to the almost exclusive use of data models. This commitment has led to irrelevant theory, questionable conclusions, and kept statisticians from working on a large range of interesting current problems. Algorithmic modeling, both in theory and practice, has developed rapidly in fields outside statistics. So it's all pretty damning. So why do we use machine learning? You know, what is it that, that, that makes it better or makes it more appropriate than statistics in so many different applications? Well, for a start, there are certain problems that can only really be addressed with machine learning, um, particularly true when we're dealing with unstructured data, such as uh, video data or large amounts of text data, social media data, um, audio data. You know, machine learning is particularly adept at, at working with that type of information so that it can do things like recognize an individual or categorize an object or something like that. And there are lots of situations where accuracy is simply more important than, than transparency, where they're not that interested in how the model is working as long as it does its job. It's, it's an uncontroversial application, like trying to separate red apples from green apples. Um, it's often much more flexible than statistical approaches if you've ever had to do things like test for normality or to make a judgment as to when to use a parametric method as opposed to a non-parametric method. This is the sort of thing that drives you know, students crazy. Um, machine learning doesn't have distributional assumptions. It isn't based on those curves in the same way that statistics is. So it works with a lot more situations. Um, it's where the majority of research and development is definitely focused, and it's at the heart of most AI applications, which of course, we're going to see a lot more of those in the future. And lastly, because people can, you know, they can use machine learning because they now often have vast amounts of data available to them, which means that machine learning, which tends to like quite large data sizes, becomes viable when previously they could only do statistical modeling because they were working with smaller sample sizes. If you look at the role of machine learning in the COVID-19 pandemic, 
uh, it isn't hard to find lots of articles where machine learning is being used in very much a discovery uh, uh, mode, if you like. It's trawling through the current literature relating to the disease. It's finding patterns in DNA and structure of the virus. It's identifying candidate treatments. It's trying to break new ground, if you like, and, and discover you know, nuggets and, and relationships that, that perhaps you uh, are better suited to do that than, than, than classical statistics. But nevertheless, statistics is still around and it still matters. If you think about it, machine learning is often a sledgehammer approach when you need a nutcracker. You don't necessarily need to use a neural network to predict an, out, an, out, an outcome. You don't necessarily need to use, you know, some fancy technique to categorize or classify something. You can use a statistical approach. And in fact, um, it's interesting to see just how accurate a lot of classical statistical approaches actually are when they're compared to a machine learning algorithm. They actually hold their own quite well. There are lots of situations where transparency is king, where it is absolutely vital that the researchers can see what is happening inside the model. Things like epidemiology, um, things like uh, uh, related to justice or related to you know fairness, anything like that, legal requirements. They need to be able to see how the variables are related to one another and which fields the, the model is making use of. Uh, thirdly, making inferences from popul uh, about population from samples is still by far the most common analytical problem that people deal with. You know, to answer a lot of questions, we only have samples of data. And you know, if you think about surveys, questionnaires, clinical trials, scientific experiments, they are effectively relatively small samples from, from a, ver you know, a very large population most of the time. And lastly, statistics is still the science of variation. It is how things are proven in data. It's how we prove that something makes a difference, that some treatment affects something, that there is a difference between two, two groups of people and their attitudes or their experiences. And if you look at statistics in the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, they're answering all the other questions that, that machine learning isn't, such as you know, which techniques are we using to monitor the virus's prevalence in the country. We're using statistical techniques to do that. How is the R value calculated uh, for a population? And this is the, the rate of uh, reinfection, if you like, or cross infection for the, for the disease. You, you, you'll notice that that's often shown as an interval. That's a classical, classical confidence interval that we're taught. It's a statistical concept. How are treatments evaluated and proven? When, when clinical trials are done with certain treatments and they're saying this treatment does appear to be effective against the virus, how has that been proven? Using statistical methods. And how are different countries' outbreak rate, rates actually compared? Again, statistics is, is the tool that most people are reaching for. So what might we expect in the future? Well, I suspect we'll see a growing appreciation actually of statistical expertise on the supply side. Um, statistics is, is pretty important to data science. You know, it's pretty hard to be an effective expert in, let's say, machine learning or data science unless you've got a pretty good grounding in statistics. So I suspect that there will be more appreciation for statistics. Secondly, mach machine learning and AI are obviously going to continue to grow. And, you know, the purest distinctions between them may disappear over time. They'll just call it AI, they'll just call it machine learning or, or whatever. But but we're going to see an awful lot more applications in the future, of course. And, and these are applications which we really, really can't anticipate. Um, some of the applications I've seen are things which I really wouldn't have known about uh, in, in, any other, in any other context. Things like veterinary applications where it's used to monitor you know, outbreaks of diseases in pigs and pigs. And some very unusual um, social media applications using machine learning. There's going to be a lot more tools available to citizen data scientists. So these are you know, cloud-based, often niche, and they're going to be delivered through simple user interfaces, you know, uh, iPhones and, 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 and tablet-based interfaces. If you think about the sorts of cloud-based uh, niche uh, applications that are available out there just for the, around COVID that people have been making use of, you can expect to see similar sorts of things, but using machine learning. Uh, and there will be a lot more controversy, of course. Algorithmic decision-making is power. It's a powerful new way, tool for many agencies, those agencies being uh, on the private sector side and on the public sector side. And there are going to be more calls for 
greater transparency and greater accountability. Thanks very much to the ASC for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. If you do have any questions and you want to get in contact with me, please just drop me an email at jquinn at sv-europe.com and I'll be happy to help. Thanks again. Really interesting content. Thank you, Jarlith. Um, a hot topic. Where will the future take us? If you'd like to join in on that discussion, you can contact Jarlith directly, put comments below, uh, tweet with the hashtag ASCorg. If you have any ASC-related questions or just want to get involved, everybody's welcome. Message admin at asc.org.uk. Sign up to our mailing list, follow us on Twitter and connect with the committee via LinkedIn. Hope to see you again soon.